important. Uh, we're talking about forming covenant with one another. Been in a three-week series here about covenant. And uh, covenant is actually a very broad and deep subject. In fact, uh, if, if I would talk about salvation, you know, where do you start? Where do you, what do you include and where do you end? Or I would talk about faith or talk about grace. I mean, they're, they're wide, deep subjects. And so you get talking about covenant in reality, uh, it's like, well, what do I pick and what do I choose? So um, that's kind of what we're in. Hope you've been learning a few things. I certainly have been growing in my study and learning. Of course, I learned the most. Uh, sorry about that. I learned the most because I, <laughs> I study and bring the message and uh, things that I, I learn I don't get to share because I only have about 30 minutes. I, I did set the clock up this morning because I got in looking at it and I was like, I got a whole extra hour to preach. That's what the clock says. So I got it right, and um, most of you showed up on time this morning, and we're all good. But getting back to covenant, one of the things that I started out with was just reframing this book for you. We call the Bible. And most of the time when you get acquainted to it, it's, it talks about the Old Testament and the New Testament. But in reality, this is one book, and it's filled with eight basic covenants that God made with mankind. It's one book, eight covenants covenants. Seven of those are in operation today. The eighth one is yet to be fulfilled. Kingdom reign when God comes back, when, when Jesus comes back and sets this planet back into order. That's prophesied about, spoken about, promised, but it hasn't happened yet. It's going to come in the future. But this book is really comprised of eight covenants and they're still in operation today. Now there's aspects that that uh, are, are, uh, are not, uh, have changed. For instance, we're not sacrificing animals anymore to atone for our sins so that we can be right with God. Because the one perfect sacrifice has come. His name is Jesus Christ. So we're not sacrificing animals anymore. But the covenant is still in effect. There needs to be the shedding of blood so that we can have forgiveness of sin. And that's the blood of Jesus that is still atoning today so that we can be forgiven. That covenant is still in effect. It's just practiced differently. We believe by faith uh, rather than going out and, again, uh, slaughtering animals. So I talked about that in the beginning. And uh, then we, we, uh, that, that first message also talked about the cost of entering covenant. Most of the time we like to cut cost. But Jesus says count the cost. And he was very clear with his disciples. Count the cost of following me. He made bold statements. In fact, he even offended his disciples at times to see if they would still follow. And they did. They passed the test. And you and I are going to have that same encounter with the Lord. Where there's going to come a time when we're going to ask ourselves, is it really worth it to follow Jesus? My answer to that personally is yes. But you'll have to determine that for yourself. But Jesus is very clear there's a cost to following him. You'll be ridiculed. You'll be laughed at. You won't be understood. People will hurl insults at you at times. And that's all part of the cost of following Jesus. But the rewards are like they say out of this world. No, they're a part of this world too. It's exciting to follow Jesus in this world. Not just waiting for the next. And then we jumped into last week. As far as talking about covenant that God makes with us. And we use the example of Abraham. And when God starts out in making a covenant with us, he's the one that always takes the initiative. He starts it. We could care less, but he gets our attention. Think about the time, if you've made a decision to follow Christ, that God got your attention. It may have happened over a long period of time, or it may have been very short, but God got your attention. And he may have done it through something that uh, maybe the consequences are still lingering today. Maybe they're not. But God got your attention through whatever happened. And he said, I want you. I want you to be mine. I want you to be a son or daughter of mine. And so that's what happened with Abraham. He was 70 years old, 75 years old. He had retired from his corporate job. He was hanging out and doing nothing. And God says, I've called you. I want you to go to a land that I will show you. And Abraham went. 75 years old. So you're not too old. To make a decision to follow God. Follow him. And uh, maybe some of you 90 year old ladies who get pregnant. Who knows. <laughs> oh my goodness. We better not start there. But that's what Abraham did. And so um, we have a, an amazing journey. God took the initiative. And Abraham then uh, followed God. 
And so once they got into the land, then he made a covenant with him. Once they got into the land. And they started, uh, first of all, there was a ceremony of this covenant. It was a ceremony of sacrifice. Now, the ceremony that, that Abraham and God participated in, they took animals and cut them in half. And the people that were forming covenant walked in between those dead, halved animals. And the essence was, if we don't carry out the terms of this covenant that we're making, if either party would break it, may it be done to us what we have done to these animals. That was in essence, you read about that in Jeremiah 34. It talks about the, 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 the consequences of not carrying the covenant. And so we see that uh, taking place. And then God and Abram, they, they journeyed more for a couple of years. And, and then uh, God would come back and remind Abram about this covenant. And at one point, they came to the place where they changed his name. And perhaps you were here last Sunday, or if, if you didn't see that, it's incredible how God took part of his own name. And he inserted it into Abraham's name. And now God says, I'm a part of your name. He took his name, inserted it in Abraham. Now I'm a part of your name. So God's got stake in this now. Whatever Abraham does from then on, God says, I'm participating with you. I'm in this. And so he had an identity change after that. And we have an identity change after we meet Jesus. The Bible says we're no longer sinners, but saints. That's how we need to think of ourselves. That we're not aliens anymore. We're sons or daughters. We're family. God says that when we know Jesus and serve him, we're holy and family. And that's how we need to think of ourselves. And many people, many Christians never get to that level where they walk around thinking, I'm a son or daughter of the king. He's my dad. I'm in his family. Many of us never get to that level of walking around daily pondering that and thinking that. We barely get off the fact that we're, we're saved. And we carry around the idea that I'm just really teetering on the edge. I could really fall back into, into where I was before, but I'm pushing forward. And we're in this place where, where we're frail and barely hanging on. That's not Christianity. That's not New Testament Christianity. It's settled the fact that God's made a covenant with him and we've made a covenant with him. Our name has been changed. The ceremony, the, the sacrifice ceremony that, that now we look upon as the cross. Everybody should see the passion of the Christ at least once. At least once. To gain a little bit of understanding of what Jesus went through. If you haven't seen it, watch it. I would never, no. Having said that, it's an R-rated movie. <laughs> I don't advocate watching R-rated movies, but that one is. You know why? Because the, 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 the incredible, um, the brutality, thank you, of, of what is done to a human being is absolutely the most horrific effect upon us as human beings. And, and as you watch that, and I shared last week, that's only touching into two of our senses. When we watch a movie, we see it and we, we hear the sound. There's three other senses that, not, that are not being touched into at that point. What if we were there that day? So that's the ceremony we need to watch of what Jesus did for us. And then the name change. And then circumcision. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah. Skin in the game, right, so to speak. No, Abraham, God says, okay, it's time for you to step it up here. And he says, I want you and your household to be circumcised. And Abraham went out and did that. What's the equivalent of that today is baptism. That we identify fully with Christ. When we go under the water and we're buried and we come out with new life. We are symbolizing, identifying that the old man, the old person is done. And bring on the new person in Christ. That's what we're symbolizing in baptism. We had a little video a couple of weeks ago. And it talked about. So in the early church. There were no unbaptized believers. And so we're going to hear testimonies of the four guys. I've asked them to share. Why they're being baptized. Here at the end of the, end of the service. Uh, because each one of us have, have made a decision for Christ years ago. But there's something that you're going to hear. That I believe is, is significant. That God placed on my heart and the other guys as well. So today we're going to look at forming a covenant with one another. Last week was with God. Today with one another. 
And again, this book is full of covenants that people formed with one another. Sometimes they formed covenants with people greater than themselves. Sometimes it was just, uh, again, like marriage or so forth. It was just uh, among uh, equals, so to speak. So let's get started here. Number one, always build a relationship before entering covenant. You have your Bibles? Turn to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. Always build a relationship before entering a covenant with someone else or some other organization. We see in verse 22 where it says, At that time, Abimelech said to Abraham, God is with you in everything that you do. Now, how was he able to make that statement? Because Abraham had lived among the people under Abimelech's rule. He had lived in his land for a period of time. We're going to catch up on that in a few moments back in Genesis 20. He lived there for a period of time. And so Abimelech actually watched Abraham. He watched his sheep multiply. He watched his crops grow. He watched the rains come at just the right time. And he concluded out of observation, he concluded that God is with you in everything you do. I want to be a part of that. I want us to get connected here in a covenant because I want some of that. Now, something you might not realize that will probably become more into focus at the end of the message is this guy named Abimelech was actually not his personal name. It was his positional name, meaning that they called the leader of the land or the king of the land, they called him Abimelech, like we would call Donald Trump today the president. They called him Abimelech, or if you're in a country where they'd be a prime minister, you would say Mr. or Mrs. Prime Minister. You wouldn't call them the personal name. You'd call them by the positional name. And Abimelech is a positional name. Why do I say that? Because Abraham encounters him. And then Isaac encounters a guy by the name of Abimelech. You think, wow, he must have lived a long time and he was really old. No, the fact is that the Abimelech with Isaac didn't know the covenant that Abraham made with the former Abimelech. It was two different guys. But the same name Abimelech. And so again this is his positional name. Not his, his personal name. And so Abraham moves into the land where Abimelech is. And they're building relationship before entering a covenant. And that's extremely, extremely important. And so... Before you enter a covenant, whether it's marriage, whether it's a business deal, whether it's a church, uh, an organization, you need to ask yourself the question, are, am I and this other person, are we walking together in the same direction? Are we, are we, do we have the same goal in mind? In this church setting, do, do, does, does the leaders understand God in the way I understand God? Are we moving in the same direction or are we just kind of missing each other? Or someone going sideways? One of the things that, that happened when Crossroads was established that we were planted as a, as a church uh, from other affiliations that we had. And I began to realize that the vision that God had placed upon Wanda and I and where we felt like that we were supposed to go. That our present oversight wasn't going to work for us. And we needed new oversight. We needed to connect with somebody else that could really share the vision we had and stretch us into achieving that vision that we had. And so I'd heard Larry Crowder, which is international director of Dove, speak several times, and I really liked him. I thought, I thought he was great. I thought the way that he communicated, the, his heart for ministry and missions, I loved. I just really connected with him. And then somebody gave me this little, really tip. He says, if you're, if you're thinking about connecting, this would apply to an organization or maybe a church or a movement. He says, listen to the primary leader. You might not know that person personally, but listen to the primary leader of that organization or that group. And if you connect with their heart, you'll probably connect with the organization. But if you don't connect with the primary leader's heart, you probably won't connect with the organization. I remembered that. And uh, so we've been with Dove now almost 20 years, and it's been, been a, a great experience together. And so, again, Abraham and Abimelech, they're, they're living in the same land, and they're getting to know one another before they enter covenant. When one and I met, 
we knew each other in a social setting for about a year. And then we formally started dating. And then we're engaged. And then another six months, we got married. So it's about a two-year uh, uh, two um, um, process. Uh, that's not what I was hunting for, but that'll work, all right? <laughs> um, so anyhow, let's go on. But on the surface of things, we're very different. We're, uh, uh, you know, talk about, are we going the same direction of somebody you make covenant? We're very different. I grew up on a farm. She grew up in the city. Uh, she had a, 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 a dad that was a first generation Christian. I had, on my family, I had generations of dads as Christians. She uh, went to a Christian college. I did not. Um, she has two music degrees. I do not. <laughs> Um, she is, uh, she was very well known in our denomination. I was not, um, what drew us together? She's a light sleeper. I am not. What drew us together? It was really this issue of, we had the same spiritual hunger together. We had the same desire to honor God equally. We had the same desire to grow. We had the same desire to live on the cutting edge of what God was doing. It wasn't all those peripheral things, even though they, they presented challenges at times. They didn't matter as much as the core key root in our lives. And that's why we formed covenant together. And we're 31 years into this thing, and it's amazing. It just keeps getting better and better. There's a friend of mine. His name's Jeff. He's passed away on the other side some of you would know him and he said that his first wife was catholic and jeff became a christian and uh, he tried to live and talk and 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 tried to to show her you know uh, jesus and living for jesus it just didn't work and i think she ended up having an affair and that that uh, marriage failed he said my second marriage i tried to learn from the first and so i married a lady that we had everything in common that we could on the surface. They were in the same uh, profession. They, they loved the outdoors. They loved animals. They loved cars. I mean, they just, they, they had just so many likes together on the surface of what they enjoyed in the natural. But they had one problem. They had a spiritual difference. And that was the thing that took them down. The spiritual difference. They had everything else in common. And then Jeff got a brain tumor. And uh, the gal that worked in his office, he was a dentist. The gal that worked in his office, she stuck with him. She was there through, I mean, thick and thin. She was right there by her side. And Jeff had an operation, pulled the tumor out of his head, realizing that uh, it could come back. But he said, that's not going to stop me from living. He was single. He got married. He had a child. He said, I am going to live like I am healed and would normally live and go forward. And his wife was in total agreement. They were on the same page, headed in the same direction. And they knew what they were going into. They, they, he could have stayed single because the possibility of the tumor coming back, but he didn't. She was like, I, I fully, I know what's ahead of us, but let's get married. They came into that covenant, counting the cost. Let's have a child. And so they walked through that together. And, and we walked through the family at, at different times. And the highs and lows through that was amazing. Jeff's my hero. In a sense of how many of us, if we were in that situation, would have rolled over and said, well, I'll just stay single and see what happens. But not Jeff. He rolled in. And he counted the cost and he moved forward. What an amazing, amazing story. So uh, Abimelech and, and, and uh, Abraham are, are in the land. And we're going to jump back to uh, chapter 20. And we're going to look at this relationship building. Guess what? Authentic relationships always have conflict. <coughs> Hello. Authentic relationships always have some degree of conflict. It's not the fact that you have conflict. It's how you work through the conflict. Are you on the same page of what you want to do in working through it? And so I, I, was, uh, I remembered uh, a previous church as a state trooper that um, 
we were getting to know one another, attended our church, and, and he said, one thing I like about my marriage is that my wife and I never argue and we never have conflict. And I thought to myself, I didn't say it. I thought to myself, you have a really shallow relationship. I didn't say it because he had the handcuffs. <laughs> Wise man, right? I'm like, you never argue. You never have any conflicts. Come on. But I didn't push it. I just walked through. So they're building relationship. Here we go. Authentic relationships always have conflict. And uh, so here we are back in chapter 20. And Abraham and Abimelech, they, they get in the land. What happens? Uh, Abraham lies that Sarah's his sister. And that seems to be a common thread even with his, his son. And it says, uh, verse 3 of 20. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, and said to him You're as good as dead. Because this woman you have taken, she is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not gone near her. So he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say he is my brother? I've done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Verse 6. Then God said to him in a dream. Yes, I know that you did this in clear conscience. So I have kept you from sinning against me. Isn't that an interesting statement? God said that. Why? Because he's in covenant with Abraham. He's not in covenant with Abimelech. God's in covenant with Abraham. He never reprimanded Abraham for what he did. God rescued Abraham and Sarah. Because he's in covenant with him. But Abraham's building covenant with, with Abimelech. And so verse 7. Now return the man's wife for he is a prophet. And he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return here... If you do not return her, you may be sure that all yours, you and yours will die. You're going to be a dead man. Pretty serious stuff, even for a dream. Verse 8, early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all his officials. And when he told them all that happened, they were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abram in and said, what have you done to us? How have I wronged you that I brought you into such great guilt upon me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should not be done. And Abimelech and Abraham, and Abimelech asked Abraham, what is your reason for doing this? And Abimelech replied, I said to myself, there's surely no fear of God in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Apparently she was a pretty gorgeous woman. Besides, she is really my sister, the daughter of my father, though not through my mother. She became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. So that's kind of the, the situation. What are they doing? They're discovering, they're having a conflict. They're discovering, in, a, in essence, can we have a covenant together? Or are we going to not treat one another in a way that's right and wise? And so they're walking this thing through. They're not in covenant yet, but they're having a conflict. And so uh, Abimelech's just laying it out there before Abraham. And Abraham's giving it back exactly what had happened. And so really what conflicts help us do is they help us clarify and conclude. When you're in a relationship building part of, of deciding whether or not to enter covenant with some, with, with some an organization or, or with someone, they help us clarify and conclude. In other words, Abimelech said, hey, I'm innocent in this. And uh, God said, yeah, you're right. And so therefore, do what's right. Don't, don't do what's wrong. Do what's right. And then uh, in verse 11 through uh, 13, Abraham tells him why. He gives him an explanation. And so, again, he takes that explanation and walks with it. So what did they conclude? Again, in the midst of the conflict, they had a clarification and they had a conclusion. What did they conclude? They concluded, again, Abimelech did the right thing. And as a result of that, Abraham lived in the land that Abimelech governed. And he stayed there for a long time. So that was the conclusion at that point. We can work with one another. We've got things worked out. Now, if you think about the time period, it had to have been over at least a year because none of the women in his household were getting pregnant. 
So it couldn't have been a short period of time because God closed up the womb of all the women. And normally they would be getting pregnant and everything stopped. And so uh, uh, again, uh, Abraham prayed over Abimelech's household and they, the women started having babies again. So th this relationship building time took place at least a year for them to gain understanding about each other's character before they would enter covenant with one another. So it's absolutely critical that before you enter covenant, whatever that is and whoever it is, that you have a relationship building time to test the character of one another. Have some conflict. See if you work it out. It's really, really important. In fact, when, uh, when Dove receives churches to see if they want to be a part of the Dove family, the way that they do it is they have a year engagement period. They have a year engagement and decide we entered into a year engagement when we became a Dove church. And they decide after that period of time whether or not uh, we like them and they like us. Simple as that. And then we have a partnership together, a covenant together. Number two, determine the central direction together to form covenant. Determine the central direction together to form covenant. We're back in chapter 21 and verse 23. What is said here before they enter covenant? So again, Abraham, uh, Abimelech says, God's with you everywhere that you go uh, in everything you do. I want to be a part of that. Now, verse 23 says, now swear to me before God that you will not deal with me, deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. So they're laying out the terms. Show me in the country where you are living as an alien the same kindness that I have shown you. And Abraham says, I swear it. So at that point, they've entered covenant. They laid out the terms. I want you to deal with me uprightly. I don't want you to deceive me. I, we get it all out on the table. Let's work it out. Let's get it clarified. Let's bring it to a conclusion. Let's move forward so both of us can benefit. I want my people to benefit, and certainly you want to benefit by being in covenant together and being in the land. So both benefit uh, together. And so they, they, again, they're, they're arriving at a central direction to move forward. See, when a covenant is entered, you can now work out problems with confidence of a solution. When covenant is entered and understood, you can work out problems with confidence of a solution. I mean, right after Abraham said, I swear it, those words were still on his lips. He brought out a problem. They just formed covenant. But now he knew that since they'd enter covenant, they had the confidence they would work it out. So what was the problem that came out? We see in verse 25, as soon as Abraham said, I'll swear it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I, I didn't even know who did this. You did not tell me. I only heard about it today. Again, this guy is walking in innocence, isn't he? So he says, I guess we trust him. He's like, I, I didn't even know there was a problem. And now you're bringing it to my attention. And so Abraham brought the sheep and the cattle and gave them to Abimelech. Again, Abraham is, uh, is participating in this. And the two men make a treaty. And Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flocks. And Abimelech asked Abraham, what's the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you've set apart by themselves? And he explained, accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So the place they called it is Bathsheba because the two men swore an, an oath there. Again, they're entering into this full covenant with one another. And agreeing to work out any problems that they had with water rights. So that all the livestock of Abimelech's and Abraham's can be watered properly. So they're working this thing out. See, when you, when you enter into covenant, another bullet point I have there is you can speak the truth in love without fear of the other person pulling out. Without fear of the other person pulling out. You can speak the truth in love. Uh, probably a year ago. We had uh, an issue come up in our elder team. And uh, I don't really remember the issue anymore. But I knew it was to the place that it could have just blown us apart. Literally. I, I remember the feeling of it. And uh, so we had a meeting. And it was kind of unusual. <laughs> 
So the couple then called us a week later and they said, we want to come over and work this out. And when they got in the door, the couple said, now we're going to just get this out there before we start. We're not going anywhere and we want to work out this problem. You see, they understood covenant. They understood covenant exactly. And what peace came over Wanda and I when that was the first statement out of their mouth. See, they understood that we're in covenant together and we're going to work this out. We're not going to run. We're not going to run from it. We're going to sit and work it out. And we did. I can't even remember again what the issue was. So we worked it out and it's just gone. It's uh, on down the stream someplace and it won't be picked up again. But Ephesians says this, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up unto him who is the head that is Christ. When you speak the truth in love. Most people run from conflict. I don't necessarily like conflict. But I've determined that when things need to be confronted, I'll confront them. Not necessarily running for it, but when it happens and needs to be confronted, I'll confront it in love, of course. And so after they formed the treaty and the covenant together, it says Abraham stayed a long time in that land. It says that in verse 34 of Genesis 21. Now let's just look at some factors. If you... Um, uh, factors determining if you make or break a covenant with someone. Four, four factors we're going to look at. If you should make a covenant or maybe you should break a covenant. Now, just, a, just kind of a, a side note. But when you made a covenant in the Old Testament, you could not get out of it. There's no way that you could get out of that covenant without the consequences of, of, what, uh, of the terms... That you put in that covenant. There is no way that you would ever get out of suffering the consequences for the covenant made in the Old Testament. Hallelujah. We live in the New Testament. Because Jesus says if you make some wrong covenants. You can actually get out. Get free of the entanglements of what you're in. And you can begin again and live a new life. And that you're not going to get the backlash that's going to come on you. Like happened in the Old Testament. That's one difference. Between the old and the new. Jesus is very powerful because he lets us out of covenants. That sometimes we made in innocence. Sometimes we made them in ignorance. And then we got into them and we got, oh my. Oh my, what have I done? What has happened here? And sometimes things unfold differently than, than, than planned. So factors determine if you make or break a covenant with someone. Number one is have I sought the Lord about this? Have I sought the Lord about this? Have I brought in two or three witnesses to discuss this with? Scripture's pretty clear that it's not just yourself seeking the Lord, but two or three witnesses that you trust, that you come around and you share it with, and they go, yeah, that's the Lord, or I'm not sure that's the Lord. Let's pray on that a little longer. It's safety in having two or three people around you that are discerning and spiritual at the same level you're seeking to help you discover whether or not it is the Lord or not. So whether, whether you should proceed or maybe you should get out in some circumstance. The example that I have is Colossians chapter 9. Colossians chapter 9. When uh, Joshua was taking the children of Israel into the promised land. He encountered this group of people called the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites, they, were, they lived in the land but they dressed up. They deceived the Israelites. It's in Joshua 9. 14 and 15 and, and the story follows there. They dressed up in haggard clothing. They got molded food. And they presented themselves to the Israelites. As people that had traveled a long distance. See our food is moldy. Our clothes are tatted. Our, our hair is unkept. Because we've been traveling a long way. To get here because we want to make a treaty with you. Well. Guess what happened? Joshua 9.14 says the men of Israel sampled their provisions. Yeah, moldy, moldy food. Raggedy clothes. Okay, they must have traveled a long distance. Here's what it says. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Did not inquire of the Lord. What happened? Three days later, they found out these guys are neighbors. They're just over the hill. They got deceived. Now. They didn't know that they were being deceived in making this covenant. But did that.
break, could they get out of it? No, they couldn't. The, the, the only thing they were able to do is to make them serve the Israelites. But they could never kill them because they made a covenant not to. Generations later, King Saul either didn't know about that covenant or, or disregarded it. He killed the Gibeonites. King David, a generation further after King Saul, had a three-year famine. And he had enough wisdom to know, wait a minute, we're in a third-year famine. Something's wrong. He began to acquire the Lord. And the Lord said, you're having this famine because Saul disregarded the Gibeonite covenant. See, covenants follow through generations. And David's like, oh my, what do I do to set it straight again? And God gave him three choices to do to bring this covenant back into alignment the way it was given and everything worked out. Maybe some of you are in a famine in your life. Maybe you've made covenants in the past that you need to get out of. That's why your life's in a famine. I don't know. I'm suggesting. You're in a famine. Nothing works out. Nothing, everything seems stale. Maybe you've made a covenant still in operation you've forgotten about. Ask the Lord. Inquire of the Lord. Break the famine in your life. The next, so, have you sought the Lord about either entering a covenant or maybe the need to break one? Second, are the terms and conditions consistent with the teachings of Jesus? Are the terms and conditions of the covenant you're about to enter consistent with the teachings of Jesus? The example I have is in Judges chapter 11. Jephthah, he was a mighty warrior and he was, he was, he was bringing the people back into serving the Lord. And so uh, it says in Judges 11.30, Jephthah made a vow, he entered covenant with the Lord, if you give the Amorites into my hands, and whatever, here's what he says, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Amorites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. What was he thinking? Whatever comes out of the door of my house, I'm going to sacrifice and make a burnt off. Was he thinking a goat would come out of his house? Is he thinking a, a bull, a lamb? What is he thinking? A dog? What is he thinking? He's not. He's caught up in a moment. He's trying to be spiritual. And he's making a stupid decision that he couldn't get out of. He got back. God gave him the victory. He got back and the first thing out of his house was his teenage daughter. Dancing, yay, dad, yay, God gave me the victory, all right. And Jephthah's heart sank. Because he knew that he had to follow through with that covenant that he made. And he told his daughter, said, what had happened? And she agreed that he needed to follow through. Said, just please give me some time with my girlfriends I want to go off for a period of time and have some time with my friends because I'll never get married. And then you can sacrifice me to the Lord. Whew, what a sobering moment. See, we need to stop and think before we enter covenants. Are we making one that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus or not? See, there's organizations, and I'm not going to name any, there's organizations that are out there that seem like they're good. They seem they do good for the community. They seem they help people. But they are absolutely rotten inside. And here's the key. If any organization or group requires you to take secret oaths or secret vows, that should be your first clue this is an ungodly covenant. Because Christianity is done not in secret. Jesus was beaten in public. Jesus was put on a cross naked and hung there for everybody to see. People knew where the tomb was. They went there. They saw him buried. They went there and he wasn't there anymore. I checked a couple of years ago. He's not there. I was at the tomb. 
I checked. He's not there. <laughs> so I checked on that. He's living. He's alive. Christianity, covenants are made in public. They're not in private and they're not in secret. And any time you are invited in to do something and they say, don't tell anybody about the vows that you're taking or the secrets that are being made here. That's your first clue. This is ungodly. And let me tell you something else. That if you or ever have or your ancestors have entered into that kind of covenant, they are affecting the generations after you. They are affecting your generations after you. But praise God, those can be broken. Because we live in the New Testament where, again, those can be broken and we can be free and, and not have the effects of what, they, uh, what those uh, vows that have been taken uh, on us any longer. Hallelujah. Here's the next one. Two more. Covenants include joining spirit and soul together. It's not about a contract that you're fulfilling, you're doing your task and I'm doing mine and we're living happily ever after. No, you actually join spirit and soul. What you have coming out of you flows into them and what they have coming out of them flows into you. Pretty serious stuff. Listen to Saul and Jonathan. 1 Samuel 18, 1 and 4. It says, after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David. Along with his tunic, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, I don't have time to go into the significance of all that. But I'm here to say that Jonathan understood the covenant. You see, he was the, should have been the next designated king. But he knew that God had selected David. And he said, I'm going to join covenant with you, David. Because this is what God's doing. Even though it's different from my own natural family. He gave up his rights and joined covenant with him. And so the spirit of Jonathan was flowing into David. And the spirit of David was flowing into Jonathan. And their souls were knit together. In covenant relationship. In friendship. And then finally. Covenants provide safety nets in uncertain times. If you read ahead in Genesis chapter 26. You'll see that Isaac went down to the territory where a new Abimelech. Was king. And he went down. And he went through almost the identical process. That his father did. He lied about his wife. He didn't say she was his sister. He just flat out lied. There were, there were water rights problems. Again. And in fact. They were, uh, he was, uh, Isaac was actually on his way to Egypt. Which Abraham had did at one time as well. And God says, no, I want you to stay in this land. I don't want you to go to Egypt. I'm going to take care of you in this land, in the land of Abimelech. Now, I don't know if Abraham told Isaac that he'd had a covenant with, a, with the former Abimelech or not. But obviously, this one didn't know that his father had. And so he came in the land and, and they kind of knocked him around. However, Isaac prospered. It says that everything he did was returned a hundredfold. And all of a sudden, Abimelech like, whoa, just like his father or the, the former leader. Went, whoa, God must be with you because everything you do prosper. I want to get in on that. They were chasing him around all the time. And so Isaac is like, what are you doing chasing me around? And says, let's stop. Let's talk about this. And so again, they, they worked out the details. Very, very similar to how Abraham did. But the point is that God took Isaac to the place where he had made a covenant earlier with Abraham because he knew it was safe. Even though Isaac had to form another covenant with this new Abimelech, God knew that he would form one with him because he had history with the previous one. It was a safe place for him to go. It's like, where do you go when you mess up royally? Oftentimes, what do we do? We go back home, right? That's where, the, that's where the prodigal son went. 
he went back home. Why? Because he knew that he had a covenant with his father and his father would, would invite him in and he didn't know what would happen. He said, the best I can do is be a servant, invite in. See, we need to, the church needs to be a covenant people that even when people break covenant and leave, we need to be ready to invite them in. We need to be a safety net you can come back to. It's okay. I don't know what was going on, but you can come back here because we're covenant people. You had a covenant with us previously. I don't know where you've been or what you've been into, but welcome back. That's the kind of place that the church should be. A place where we understand covenant, but we welcome those back. That maybe we had covenant before and again, uh, things have happened for whatever reason, but we welcome them back. Many people comment that, uh, that they've, again, they've been with us for a while and leave and they come back. They said, such a warm welcome when I come back here. It should be that way. The church should be a place where we receive back those that have strayed. Receive back into cover. Be a safe place to know you can come back here and you can grow again. One of our former elders has a daughter that's in YWAM now. Actually, it's Sam's sister. Sam, bass player Sam. You, don't, you don't, probably don't know Sam, but maybe bass player Sam. And uh, uh, Abby texted me. She's in YWAM, and she needed a certain amount of money or she couldn't go on her, uh, on her uh, mission trip. And it, it wasn't a lot of money. To some, it may be a lot, but it wasn't a lot. But she had, uh, you know, she had done everything else. She'd raised the money for the period of training and, and she was short this amount. So what did she do? She called back to a place where she had covenant previously and said, can you help out? I was like, sure. It's done. It's paid for. What made her reach out to Crossroads is because her family was previously in covenant with Crossroads. And she thought, wow, that's a safe place to reach out to complete what God has called me to do. So we stepped in. Again, just a practical example of how covenant works there. In. So in uh, finishing up here, first of all this, we build a relationship for a period of time. You're going to enter a covenant with somebody, someone. Make sure that you take the time to build a relationship with them. Have a little conflict. All right. It's okay. Figure out what's in the character of the other person. One that I had conflict in dating. We had conflict in our marriage. We, you know, but you know, we're all purpose to walk it through. We're, walk, walk it out. Learn from it. Grow in it. I, I remember our youngest son, Joshua. Sorry, Bethany, you're hearing this for the first time. But uh, it, it's okay. It's fun. It was about six months ago. And they're married now. And God's blessing their marriage tremendously. We're sitting around the table talking. And, and I don't know what we were talking about. And, uh, and Joshua pipes up and he said, Bethany and, I, Bethany and I are certainly past the honeymoon stage in our dating. I thought, wow, that's very cool. Now they're ready for covenant. <laughs> and what was he saying? He's saying, you know what? We work through a lot in our dating relationship. And now we're ready to get on with it. And God's blessing them tremendously. It's, it's awesome to see them grow and, and things. But uh, they're neat. there's a honeymoon stage in everything. But we need to get past that in our relationship building and our covenants in order to be real. So we see this happening in, uh, in between Abraham and Abimelech. So build a relationship for a period of time. Are you both headed in the same direction? Whether it's an organization or a person or a group of people. Are you both headed in the same direction as much as you can determine? It takes time to figure that out. Factors determining if you make or break a covenant. Again, have you sought the Lord about this? Very key. In Joshua's day, they didn't. They didn't pray. Got in deep, deep trouble. Are the terms and conditions consistent with the teachings of Jesus? Question you need to ask. Or not. Sometimes you can enter things in innocence. Abimelech did. God set him straight and then he listened. Covenant includes joining spirit and soul. Understand what... You have, they have, and what they have, you get when you're in covenant together. There's this exchange that's going on. And then finally, covenants provide a safety net in uncertain times. Go back to a place where you had a covenant before and latch on 
and begin to grow. Or maybe a new place that you want to form covenant and latch on and begin to grow. Let's pray together.